lot of time. Uh, we would like to hear a lot more about what is um, entailed in crop protection. Um, as I already mentioned, uh, crop protection is quite um, um, is, is quite a, a complex issue. And uh, the methods that we all use to ensure that our crops are grown in the correct manner and that they are not uh, competing too much with the uh, with pests and disease and, uh, and weeds. We have these experts here today and I hope all of us will benefit from it. And uh, I would like to straight away get uh, uh, Peter Rani and uh, ask or request him to give us his presentation at this moment. Peter, the floor is yours. Again, Joshua, um, I'll be sharing my, my screen. I prepared some, some presentation here. I hope everyone can see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. Um, so again, thank you. Thank you, Joshua, for this op opportunity. Um, uh, I would like to say, and I'm a, I'm a trained agricultural economist uh, who found himself in uh, uh, agronomy. I found my feet mostly stepping into crop production and crop protection is one of the uh, complex topics that farmers actually come across, yeah. It's, it's actually a broad uh, topic that we cannot discuss in one go and say that we are done. So um, to understand crop protection, it's very important to go through the basics before we even actually dive into the specifics, right? So um, in this situation, um, I want to look at crop production, like any project or like a human being, like for any human being or like a kid who is being nurtured at any given point, they get some cord. Um, this kid sometimes will have some illness, yeah? And he as a parent have to understand some of these challenges so that, you know, how does these challenges manifest themselves uh, in this kid? So like a crop and to a, a farmer, one need to understand, when is it uh, this time when a crop is facing some obstacles, yeah? And there are four main categories of obstacles that crops uh, go through or will be faced um, at any given time of production. And to look at them, basically most farmers will talk about pests and diseases. We have weeds uh, and often the weather. So sometimes the weather could be too harsh for the crop. It becomes an obstacle to that crop. Well, to, to talk about pest, a pest is any organism that will um, fight a host in any crop, um, any, any beneficial crop that a farmer is doing for profit making. So you as a farmer need to understand what kind of pest am I dealing with? Is it a pest that is attacking my leaves? Is this pest attacking the stem? Or is the pest attacking the root? So which is the best mechanism to uh, handle such a problem or such an obstacle that when it is tries? So on the other part, you need to understand when you're talking about uh, crop production, there's another obstacle that is called diseases. Diseases manifest themselves also in different ways. So you need to understand as a farmer, uh, when you are growing a tomato crop, are you doing it, doing it uh, outdoor or uh, indoor? So when you are doing it indoor, are, are there diseases that are prevalent in such a condition whereby it's a bit warm and humid as opposed to when you're doing it outdoor, yeah? So you as a farmer need to understand, when I am doing a certain crop, for example, I'm doing potatoes, there's a, a disease that I'm, I might come across that manifests itself in this, uh, in one or two ways. How do you identify this disease? Once you get to understand how you um, uh, identify the disease, then you'll be able to um, maybe come up with a regime of diagnostic that will actually address the right problem. On the other hand, we have um, obstacles like weeds. This is one of the obstacles that most farmers will overlook. Uh, they'll actually assume 
this is not an obstacle in crop production. What, but one thing that is very important and critical to understand, when you allow winds to actually appear in your field, you are actually introducing a competitor to the crop that you intend to make money with. Yeah? So winds are actually obstacles that often overlooked, but they actually act as a host to most of the pests and diseases that we are trying to address. So again, when you are doing your crop production, how well are you addressing the winds problem? Yeah. How 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 uh, uh, how well how well do you look at field hygiene from uh, land preparation? A few a few um, uh, weeks ago, I, I think Devin spoke about field preparation. Right from field preparation, how do you do your field preparation? Right. How do you do your primary cultivation? And then after primary cultivation. How will you do your harrowing? How do you ensure that you let or you give a period between uh, primary cultivation for the winds to dry up? Because these are competitors and they actually act as a host to most of these pests and diseases that you're talking about. Another main obstacle that we come across or face as farmers is harsh weather. So when it is extremely hot, it, it is actually not a very good environment for a crop. Again, when it gets too cold, there are some, some of the diseases that will manifest themselves uh, in that weather. So you as a farmer need to understand how well um, with, with this crop, what kind of pests and diseases will prevail uh, in that weather. So the moment you get to understand that, you'll be in a position to know how best to address, uh, to address that uh, situation or obstacle. Um, so, Talking about the four, uh, those four main uh, obstacles, being the pest diseases, uh, winds and um, uh, uh, harsh weather, there, there are different approaches that you can use as a farmer to, to protect your crop. Basically, most, and, and the most common one is chemical, uh, chemical method, right? Um, we, we have mechanical method, we have catch farm, and we have biological methods. So when you're talking about make, uh, chemical methods, you need first of all to understand. Well, um, I want to, 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 to really address a problem that is in my tomatoes, and this is probably the tutor, absolute. How well do I understand this pest? What is the, its uh, life cycle? And what are its survival mechanism? I want to think about uh, maybe for amimum, which is the right time to apply this chemical, right? So you need to understand, um, all these dynamics for you to actually um, diagnose the best um, crop protection method. Um, on the other hand, we have mechanical methods. Uh, some of these mechanical methods include uh, weeding. weeding you, you can actually weed to, to, to remove um, the competitors in your farm, which actually, uh, uh, actually act, act as a host to the pests and diseases we're talking about. Um, Otherwise, you can employ mechanical is identifying a damaged crop. For, for example, you, you're looking at a disease that could spread easily, and it has a, uh, mainly affected a few crops in the farm. That's when you, you decide to approach, maybe bury, or even burn that crop. That's a mechanical method that you actually do before you actually employ another method. So on other methods like catch crop methods, uh, for example, for those who do strawberries, they will mainly do um, mulches uh, in, the, in the initial stages. When you employ methods like uh, mulching, you reduce chances of having um, uh, the, the soil bone pests manifesting themselves. Uh, and, um, you also reduce the chances of having winds attacking you, your crop. So biological method, it's also um, a common method that is used especially uh, in controlling pests and diseases. Um, when you're talking about aphids, a pest that is commonly um, uh, prevalent in onions or even chives, some, some of the biological methods that are used currently is that you fight, you fight farmers um, who are actually having uh, ladybugs. Ladybug is a beneficial pest that you find in your farm. So it operates on the trips, yeah? When you're talking about aphids, some people will introduce um, predating wasps, which actually help in controlling uh, some of these pests. 
So these are biological methods that we use that help in addressing some of these problems. So when you're talking about nematodes, others are having melons, right? You introduce trichoderma species that will actually attack the eggs of, the, of, of that pathogen at that stage. So there are different methods that you can use or approaches that you can use in crop protection. Sometimes you combine, looking at maybe the economic benefit of combining each. And actually the choice of which one to use is also determined by the level of attack of that obstacle. So those are the, uh, the four main um, approaches that we use, especially when addressing um, uh, the, the crop protection. So um, there are factors that we consider most uh, when we are choosing the, uh, the right approach or the crop protection approach. So one, you want to understand which is this obstacle that I really want to, to uh, address. So for example, you want to do to clear some winds in your farm and you're doing a, a crop like onions. So you want to understand what kind of weeds will I be addressing in this field of onions? Yeah. Is it in the same family with, with the onion? How, how many types of weeds do I have in that uh, field? So in that case, you, 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 you might want to understand the kind of problem that you're attacking. So in that case, you know, is chemical uh, use the most important? Is it the most economic uh, method to, to employ at that point? When you choose to do it mechanically, you want to do weeds, uh, uh, weeding in, in, in a field uh, of onions. Is it the most, uh, uh, I mean, the most prevalent uh, method to, to employ at that level? So is it time consuming again? So you need to understand which, which kind of obstacle am I going to address? The next would be um, when you're targeting a certain pest, for example, you, you have a, ma a maize field, and you realize that you have some problem in that field. So in, first of all, you need to understand what is the mold of, um, I mean, how does this pest exist in this crop? When is it mostly active, yeah? When is this pest mostly damaging this crop? So which is the best time uh, for you maybe, or which is the best type uh, of approach that you can employ to um, address such a, uh, a challenge. Again, uh, you want to understand uh, um, the cost involved. You, you look at um, a, a crop like um, carrots and it's in a field where if you look at, um, I know David talks much about uh, which a topic that's very important of crop, uh, I mean, uh, optimal uh, production per unit area and you're doing carrots and you're looking at the spacing that you have, and you have some weeds that are, um, are in that field. So how do you address the issue of weeds in that field, which is an obstacle, which is the most cost efficient uh, method? So if you decide to send some people to do weeding, will it cause actually um, uh, more uh, economic loss to you through breakages and damages to the crop, as opposed to when you decide to use maybe a chemical, a herbicide like Linaga, right? So these are some of the issues that you look at. When you decide, for example, to um, employ, uh, uh, maybe for example, think of um, uh, traps in, in, a, in, a, in a field of tomatoes, you want to invest in traps before because you know, this one will help you in reducing the prevalence of a certain pest in that crop rather than you waiting for the, uh, the pest to come on board and the, the, the cost of um, actually uh, eradicating that pest will be very high. So again, you want to understand what are the costs in, uh, involved. Looking at sustain, uh, sustainability and safety, the method that you use should be safe for you, safe to the crop and actually sustainable. You want a method that will actually address that problem and a, a problem that, I mean, a, a solution that will give you uh, a solution that will not require you to be there most often. For example, um, uh, you, you are talking about uh, rodents, which is also a pest. Uh, do you want to, uh, to, to, to continuously buy some chemicals and keep, keep them around the, 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 the field where you're doing your, your maybe sweet potatoes or carrots. I had some experience doing carrots and 
we had so many rats. Uh, maybe in, in, in investing in that field, do you want to wait and to continuously buy chemicals, put them in different locations to address that problem, or do you want to uh, maybe once clear the field and maybe eradicate all the hiding places for this guest? Those are some of the things that you look on the methods that you choose and the safety. How safe is the method that you're using to both the crop, the environment, the user, and maybe the consumer, yeah? So these approaches are very important for you to understand before you make a choice on the, I mean, on the, on the method that you, you are gonna use. So um, some of the most important tips that we need to understand um, in this topic of uh, crop protection is that one, you need to have a clean field before engaging in any activity. Like for example, um, uh, I, I like an, an analogy that was given here before. You don't want to lie in a bed that is untidy, yeah? So you want from the word go to prepare your land properly, uh, do primary cultivation, give it a few days for the winds to completely uh, dry up, then come again, do your harrowing, and then after that, you can now introduce your crop. You're introducing your crop in a field that is clean. So meaning, at the point, if, for example, you're doing the right spacing, it means that the crop will be in a position to grow quickly, and it will form its, uh, for example, a canopy that will actually um, hinder, uh, maybe like weeds to, to grow in, the, in that field. Again, a field that is clean, you are almost sure that you do not have the host crops that are hosting most of these um, pests and diseases that will actually become a menace in your in your farm in the future or in the in the process of production. So the question of field hygiene is very important. Um, so that that can never be overlooked. So secondly, you want to talk about uh, tolerance, or you want to think as a farmer, you want to think about. Do we have uh, uh, varieties that are resistant to certain diseases? Or do we have varieties that are tolerant to certain weather conditions? For example, you as a farmer, you are maybe a farmer who is in Western and likely we have cases of striger. Do we have varieties that are tolerant or resistant to striger? Yeah. Do we have varieties that are resistant to MLND? So you want to think about these issues. For example, you've been doing potatoes in your farm uh, for quite a while, or you've been doing tomatoes, and you've identified uh, issues of bacteria with. You want, first of all, before actually doing this farming, or before engaging in other uh, practices of crop protection, you first of all want to understand, do we have varieties that are actually resistant to bacteria with? These are some of the important tips that farmers need to know before engaging into uh, actual direct planting, which is a crew business. So another issue that is very important and often overlooked by many farmers is monitoring weather conditions. Weather is a, is, is a very important aspect. And you as a farmer who is actually growing and actually feeding your crop, often you actually do this in your farm, you need to understand how will the weather be after maybe I do this activity? How well have you as a farmer uh, liaised with the meteorological department within your area? Do, do you have uh, constant messages that are flowing into you, uh, your uh, maybe, maybe your phone, then you know that this is how the weather will be throughout the week. This is information that is available to many farmers. And um, last year I was uh, actively involved in to farming and I can tell you, I went to a meteorological department office. I told them uh, some of the information that I require as a farmer is weather data. And from that point up to date, I still get uh, weather information of the area where I was actually farming. So for example, I want to delegate, or I want to send someone into a certain field in the evening and tell them, I want us to target, uh, I mean, uh, fall animal in my maze, and then, the way that data shows you that in the next one hour, there will be some rain. So you as a farmer will actually not have really addressed the, the issue that you wanted to address because, for example, the chemical has been washed away. 
then they also become hazardous to environment because the chemicals will be washed and they the, the actually will be washed down to the, to the rivers. And this is still the same water that we are drinking. So here the farmer need to understand, how is the weather? How, how, how is that pattern? Get this information from the relevant bodies that are offering this information. The other point which is very important is crop rotation. I may not want to dive much into this one because it's a, 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 a topic that we've really discussed here, but crop rotation helps to actually break that cycle of uh, different pests and diseases. For example, um, some of these uh, pests will lay their eggs and they will actually hide in the soils waiting for the next crop. So for example, you, you are doing potato crop and the next crop that you want to do in the same field, maybe as a tomato crop. You need to understand these are in the same family. So for example, if you have uh, an issue of um, tuta absoluta, so you know the next host, uh, I mean the next crop that you're going to do is potatoes. This crop will actually act as a host to the same, same pest. And the next time that you're doing the same crop, I think that you actually have a challenge of controlling that pest. So it's best that you understand the crop rotational regime. Yeah, so that's another point that is very important. Um, understanding the life cycle and uh, survival mechanism of pest, like I, I, I mentioned earlier, you need to understand <clears throat> what is really the behavior of the pest that I am really addressing, yeah? When is the right time to actually spray against this pest, yeah? What, what are actually the chemicals that I really need, for example, if you're using chemicals to address a certain state of this pest. Yeah. So for example, you want to do, you are doing a, a crop where you have um, aphids or maybe say ventrit, and you know within a three weeks period, this pest will have actually completed its life cycle. Hi. Sorry. Uh -huh. so, uh, okay. Ricky, Ricky, could you mute? Okay, okay. So, all right, great. So, so you really want to understand um, the, the, the kind of method that I'm going to use to protect this crop from this pest. Is, is, is my method going to address the adult uh, pest? Is it leaving out the, the, the eggs, or even the larval stage? So for you as a farmer, you need to understand which kind of approach do I need to use that will address the whole problem? So that's a very important tip that farmers need to understand. The other one is preventative and curative. I really like to remember uh, the way Joshua did put it last time, that if you really do not prevent it from uh, at the initial stages, curing that uh, disease or maybe uh, attacking the past in future at a um, hazardous stage will actually be very difficult for a farmer. So you really need to understand as a farmer the life cycle of that crop. So which kind of pests or diseases usually attack at, at, at a certain stages? Yeah. So you want to know at maybe week three, these are the times I expect to see uh, maybe this and that in this crop. So I need to actually like, apply a preventative uh, pesticide that actually reduce instances of I now investing in curing the same disease, knowing that once um, the, the crop becomes maybe diseased, it also actually reduces its vigor. So even the production will actually go down. So these are some of the issues that farmers need to understand before they actually engage into farming and actually make the choice of um, uh, crop protection. Lastly, but not the least, a question is always asked um, as to how this information is available to small scale farmers. So there are so many platforms where small scale farmers can access this information. I know a few percentage who will have actually access to internet uh, and can be able to browse and know how I can do this and that within a certain period. But again, looking at um, the spread of small scale farmers, most of them, these people, the point, um, the point of contact between a chemical and application mostly it's usually at the agro dealer level. So how can these farmers actually know this information before they actually consume this information or actually use a certain chemical? 
So it's actually very important for farmers to understand that they actually have uh, Ministry of Agriculture offices at actually what levels that they can actually consult and know what they need to do at certain levels of crop production, yeah? How do they address issues of crop protection when they are dealing with coffee crop? So this is one avenue that farmers can use. Um, recently, I've seen Ministry of Agriculture is even having mobile apps that can guide farmers on how to um, employ certain techniques or skills at different stages. The second one and the most important um, uh, point is for the input manufacturers and providers, they really need and, uh, to, to train this point of, um, uh, I mean, the farmer's point of first contact of this chemical, they really need to know that person who is at the, uh, at the counter level, how is he or she well versed with the chemical that they are selling? Because the approach that most farmers use, especially the small scale farmer is they'll walk into an agrovet and they'll be saying, I saw this and this type of pest in my farm. So how best do I uh, address this issue? So it's also um, important for the input providers or manufacturers to ensure that they really equip suppliers of their product. That this is something that is ongoing, but I didn't think uh, it's something that also needs to be continuous for these people to continuously have this information which is relevant for the farmers or the users of the end product. The third point, uh, which is, is also very important, um, we are in an era where uh, technology is also developing very fast and so many companies are actually up upcoming. So um, I currently work with the company that uh, leverage much on technology and some of the platforms that we use to ensure that the farmers get this information, uh, IVRs, interactive voice responses, whereby we are working with farmers uh, who actually do image and you want to advise them or you want to have a recorded voice that will advise them prior to the activity that they need to do, what they're actually supposed to do. Others are actually investing in picture-based uh, training, which is actually very important. You, you find like uh, input providers um, having maybe a list of activities that these farmers need to do and sometimes supporting it with a picture of what they need to do at different stages of crop or what they need to do when they see a certain pest. Yeah. So this, these platforms and um, uh, things like video-based agronomy, this is something that can really go far in terms of uh, assisting farmers in knowing how best to address the issue of crop protection. So again, we have bodies like SOCA and so many others that are supporting small scale farmers or that are also available to support small scale farmers in uh, uh, handling the issue of crop protection. So thank you, Joshua. Um, that's um, part of my presentation. Happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a, that was a quite elaborate uh, presentation on uh, crop protection. Uh, you brought the issues very clearly. Uh, but uh, before I release you, I, I just want to engage you a little bit on uh, something that uh, just cropped up in my mind. And this is to do with uh, mm -hmm. uh, the whole concept of uh, crop protection. I say this because you, mm -hmm. as, a, as a grower, you practice uh, crop, crop rotation, which is part of, uh, you know, uh, crop rotation as part of crop protection. And you also practice uh, field hygiene. You plant uh, tolerant varieties, and you also understand the life cycle of uh, of the of the crop. And that means already these four uh, items are enough to enable you um, have a, a, a good crop. Why then do we have only the last bit, which is the preventive and curative part, forming the billion dollar industry? Yet we have the other parts of the of the practice that are, you know, could still do the job. Why is the concentration a lot more on this last bit, which is the preventive and curative measures? Is it just business, or do we really need it when we are already practicing the rest? Thank you. Thank you for that question, uh, Joshua. Um, 
one thing, and it's also a question I can also defer to Devin. Um, one thing that um, I would like to point out is the efforts that we actually put into all these missions could be different. Maybe the efforts that we are really putting out there to the end consumer of this information is the preventative and curative measures. But how often do you train farmers on uh, maybe crop rotation, on use of tolerant varieties? Maybe our focus has been initially there before being on preventative and curative measures, whereas we leave um, uh, much of the information that farmers need on these other measures. So moving forward, I think it's also imperative to uh, put the same strength in these other uh, practices to ensure that farmers actually get it right from that level. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, finally, um, just one question on the biologicals, uh, because you know, if uh, if you talk to a farmer, and more mm -hmm. so the elderly farmers, the the, the ones uh, the the of, uh, uh, of of home. And you talk to them about these biological controls. And in their minds, it's basically, you are adding other VG doodles inside the soil. Um, and that for them is a real problem. How do you uh, tackle this kind of issue with that group of farmers? Sure. Um, yeah, I can tell you it's quite challenging. And, uh, uh, but they also understand because if, if you meet an elder farmer today uh, in a coffee farm, and you see a chameleon actually walking around, they'll tell you that is actually a, a, a pest control method. So do not kill that chameleon. So I, like I said initially, we are actually not focusing much into delivering this information to these people. They actually know part of this information. Like they will tell you, a chameleon will actually assist me in uh, attacking certain pests. But how often have we dived deeper uh, into actually telling them there is another uh, beneficial pest like predictive wasp, like predictive mite that you could actually introduce into your crop uh, and it would help you into managing such pests. So again, I'll still bring it back to uh, the issue of awareness and how best we uh, present it to these farmers. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Peter. I will let you take a glass of water at this uh, moment, and uh, yeah. maybe we'll come back to you later in case more questions come up. Um, I think uh, that was a very uh, good insight into uh, what crop protection actually uh, in involves. Um, I would then uh, take this opportunity now to go to our next presenter. Um, in uh, our previous presentations, um, uh, David has not been showing us uh, uh, real presentations. And this has uh, solicited quite a, a number of questions or a number of uh, requests from our viewers that uh, we actually have a presentation from David coming from the previous uh, uh, discussions we have had. And uh, I think uh, David, uh, probably tonight you are ready with something, maybe not not all, but uh, something for today's discussion. But uh, just bear in mind that uh, our viewers are still asking for your previous uh, presentations. So David, um, let me give you this chance to tell us what you have today uh, with regards to uh, uh, crop protection and uh, how it is, uh, uh, how it helps to enhance uh, food security and safety. David. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, thank you for having me this, uh, this uh, evening. Yes, indeed, I have a presentation. Uh, let me let me put it in. I'm sure it's, you can be able to see it. Uh, now, um, yes, viewers, we are talking about uh, crop protection. Crop protection is a very broad uh, topic as my fellow presenter, Mr. Muthi Munire said. Um, and it's all about Hearing that uh, we get the crop the moment we plant. Um, 
anything that needs to be, we are protecting the crop, we are talking about protecting that crop. If we had our way, we would uh, do without spraying. But the spraying is not the only uh, protection that is offered. As uh, Peter has explained, I'm going to be to go briefly to touch on some of the areas where Peter has covered. I will just uh, go through uh, and uh, I will not talk much about it. So basically, as Peter mentioned, it has like, uh, let's say we have three major control, which is which can be termed as integrated crop or pest management or crop protection. You cannot use these, um, you cannot just use one option and say we're going to protect the crop. And why do we need to protect the crop? We need to protect the crop because plant, our target is to get uh, maximum production from the crop that we are, we are planted. If we take care of uh, all other aspects, all key uh, crop production aspects, Let's say we plow our land well, we irrigate properly, we plant properly using manure, fertilizer, and then we fail to control the pests or even the weeds, then we may lose up to 60%. If we sell, we get 40% of the entire production, then uh, having, if we are doing uh, farming as a business, then we'll be uh, on the red. So to ensure that we, rem we remain afloat in this farming business, we have to ensure or we have to have effective crop protection through cultural methods, through biological methods, and through chemical control. Let me say that um, where chemical control has to be employed, uh, this decision should be taken where other methods may not be able to offer adequate control. So we take into, we go into spraying as a measure of the last resort. Before we do that, we have to look at the cultural, uh, cultural measures. Can we remove the weeds? Can we do crop rotation? So weeds can hamper pests. If you weed, then it means that the weeds, the, the pests that were being harbored by the weeds will be eliminated. Crop rotation is a way of uh, protecting the crop as a way of managing the soil because there are some diseases that uh, affect the, the crops uh, of a given family. By planting uh, crops of different families in the same field, then you stuff the pathogens which you are attacking. For example, if you plant potatoes in a field, you find that bacterial weeds, then you do not need to plant potatoes in the same field. And not only potatoes, anything that belongs to the potato family or the or Solanaceous family need not be planted in a field where uh, soil pathogens that attacks Solanaceous are, are, are present. So in such a field, you can plant uh, brassica or cabbages, or you can do something like maize or a legume or a root crop, provided it doesn't, it's not a host or it's not affected by the, the pathogens affects the, the tomatoes. The barriers, hey. the barriers, these are things that you can. Uh, hey, so you had joined, did you? Ricky, could you mute again? Uh, no, 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 it's it's on. Ricky. I don't know how why you dropped off. We'll just Ricky. try your link again. Ricky, kindly mute. Because they should. There is everyone else is still on the on the on the whatever. Ricky, mute. Yeah, yeah, no one else has dropped off. Ricky, you should mute. All right. Now, uh, these barriers are physical obstacles that can be put in, a, in a, or the borders of the farm, which can uh, 
protect uh, the movement of pests or even diseases to the next crop region by putting greenhouses. Possibly you can prevent the transmission of powdery mildew from one greenhouse to the other one. Then plowing. Plowing can also be used as a cultural method, especially if you have uh, pests that uh, lay eggs in the soil by plowing and overturning the soil. Best. Biological control that has been addressed, mainly I would want to say that uh, something that you can effectively control using uh, biological control or using insects is leaf miner, uh, specifically using like glyphos. Chemical control, that one I had mentioned about, if you decide to go to chemical ways, then you have you must have tried other ways and um, if you're not, uh, if you do not get the proper control from them, then you can go into chemical control. This is your making procedures. So when you want to, before you decide to spray, you have to go through some uh, decision-making uh, procedures in order to ensure that one is making judicial, judicious decisions on sprays. It is important to ensure that the following procedures, stroke systems in a farm, which will ensure that spraying is carried out as per the good agricultural practices requirements. Number one, how do you get to know that you have pest and disease or a disease in the field? You have to do scouting. And how do you scouting? Uh, scouting is um, a method that is used in trying to assess the, the thresholds or the quantities of, of pest or the effect of diseases and pests in the field. So how do you do that? You just walk in the field and start looking at the plants the best and most appropriate way is to introduce introduce uh, scouting stations preferably about 10 stations that are ordinary uh, put or fixed in a field let's say if you have divided your field in, in beds you can say you use from the fifth bed you put a peg somewhere and then you put 10 pegs in the field and that becomes your those, those pegs becomes your areas where you'll be uh, inspecting whether you have pests in the field. So when you go to a station, you evaluate within one meter. If let's say, for example, you are scouting for blight in potatoes, within one meter, you will count the number of plants that have been affected. If it is one, you put one, then you go to station two. Then within that area, you see whether you have got other pests that are affecting that crop. Then you go to station two, you record the number of pests and diseases that you may find up to station number 10. Then you get an average. That average will, will let you, will help you in uh, getting to know to going to number two, where you have the thresholds levels. You set the threshold levels based on the part of the crop that is being affected. Why I'm saying the part is because if you are, like I explained last time, if you're dealing with uh, onions, the part of onion that is uh, the commercial part of the onion cannot be affected by the thrip, cannot be damaged by the thrip. The thrips can damage the, the top part of the, or the flag of the onion, which will end up interfering with uh, photosynthesis which will affect the production, but they, do, they will not harm the bulb itself. But if you're talking about French bean, the part that is the commercial part or the part that is sold is at the direct exposure to uh, thrips. So if that, part, if that part gets damaged, then uh, we will lead to ingestion. So the threshold for thrips for fine French beans is not the same as what you would use on grapes in potatoes or tomatoes. Then uh, the other thing is that uh, one must learn uh, about predisposing factors. What are predisposing factors? These are other factors. Yeah, you may not see the disease in the field, but then you would, uh, if for example, you are coming into the rain season and you know the problems that are associated with uh, moisture or wetness, leaf wetness, the downy mildews uh, will, will increase. 
So once you know that uh, you are going into a certain weather factor, or let's say, for example, whether whether to whether <laughs> both of those parameters support different types of diseases, like dry weather would support high prevalences of mildew, while wet weather will uh, support high prevalences of um, down mildew. So that knowledge is very very important. Uh, knowledge about the pest and diseases life history. You need to know um, um, if you are dealing with tutor. And somebody may ask, why do I want to know the life history? Let's say, for example, white fly that has got different stages. <clears throat> you could be having could be having the eggs. You have the eggs. You have the chloras. You have the and you have the adult. So, if you are targeting the adult. You may not, the, the chemicals that are recommended for adults may not have an effect on the eggs. So we're just doing adult adults, and then uh, your head, your, the youngsters and growers will be um, um, metaphor, metaphor, may, will be, will be changing very quickly into, into, into adults. And then you need to, once you decide to, if you are, Spraying against white flies, you need to effectively to get you get you need to get to know uh, what stages you are dealing with and what are the right chemicals to deal with uh, each and every stage. Number five is understanding chemicals mode of action and active ingredients. Mode of action is when when do you use the contact chemicals and when do you use systemic. Let's say for example, if you are tackling light in potatoes or in tomatoes. The best and that uh, blights in potatoes have got a very uh, slim threshold. You do not have to wait to see um, bacterial blight, especially if you are a farmer doing com potatoes on a commercial, on a, on a, on a large scale in a large scale. So you need to have what I would call a prophylactic spray program. I'm going to come to that and explain what is that. If you design, when you design the, the, the spray program, you need to do, start with curative. Why curative? Because curatives, are, I mean, you start with protectants. Protectants are broad spectrum. They are multi-sites. They act on different sites of the fungi that they are affecting. So once you cover, let's say, for example, you are using Mancozeb, provided you cover the spray coverage is good, um, and you start with Mancozeb or a Propineb, and then you'll, you'll give the crop a very good cover as you start with, then systemic or curative to ensure that any spore that could have landed onto your leaves, it may, be, it may not be feasible, but if you look at the weather and you see that uh, there is a likelihood of uh, blight to become a problem, you introduce the systemics. Understanding chemical mode of action, that one I've said. And then number six, you need to ensure that you understand what resistance management is all about. So on resistance, you need to be using chemicals with different mode of action, like uh, most of the systemics, unfortunately, they are, they are sites, and uh, it's very easy to develop resistance if you rely on, uh, on, on systemics or curatives. Then you go to the type of spray programs. There are two main different, there are two major spray programs that you can use as a farmer. Uh, is number one is based on scouting. So if you go to and scout and you find that the threshold levels allows you to spray, um, then you decide on the chemical to spray at that particular time based on the scouting program. That is a spray program based on this. Okay. Now um, that one. Um, you don't need to see the problem for you to spray. Is you look at potatoes or tomatoes, and then you say, um, last season I was affected by this. I did the scouting, but I was still hit. Because if you get a hit, for example, by bacterial, uh, by, by blight, uh, 
curative chemicals will help you to some extent once the problem gets in. But the best thing is to ensure that the problem doesn't attack or the disease does not attack the crop. So you employ a prophylactic spray program. So once you're looking, you're looking at what do I use in week one, week two, week three, and this, this should be controlled using mancozeb, propineb, uh, iotanate, uh, chlorothalonil is not, uh, not being used currently as much as it used to be done um, in the past because of some, of some issues, but still in use. Then from week five, you come up with um, uh, curative, something like if you are doing potatoes, you come with something like infinito, come with some uh, ridomil and, and light. So once the decision to spray has been made, then the, I'm going to assist you in the decision making process. Number one, you list down the, the recommended pesticides. Let's say, for example, if you are doing potatoes, what are the, the recommended uh, pesticides for the problem at hand? Consider the PHI. For example, if you are, if you are spraying uh, French beans, you would want to consider to look at the PHI and see how many days you have to wait before you harvest. Consider the price of the pesticide. Consider the spray uh, product toxicological rating and substitute where less toxic chemicals uh, chemical may be used. Uh, by toxicological rating, I mean if it's instead of using a class one, you can use class three or class two if you are doing the worst. The last year you're doing class one, but a bit better class two, but the best or what would I would recommend is to the use of class threes. Consider the people who we do as they have the right PPE. PPE, uh, uh, um, it's important to ensure that uh, you have personal protective equipment for the people who are, who are exposed to chemicals to ensure that their health is not put into your product. Chemicals are harmful, they are hazardous to, to health. And the best thing is to, consult, to, to control the hazard by use of uh, the right PPE, mainly in chemicals that are commonly used. A uh, person who is applying chemicals must have the, uh, the respirator. The respirator ensures that we have there are three modes of uh, entry, entry to that chemicals can enter into the body. There is oral, there is uh, through the smell, and dermal. So if chemicals uh, get into contact with the skin, they can be absorbed by the skin and then they can uh, harm the person who, the, the spray operator. So the, the overall needs to be one that does not absorb. And then um, the respirators must be in a good working condition. If you can smell chemical, it means that it's affecting you because you are breathing in some molecules and that's why you can smell, you can, you can smell it. Uh, number six, consider the crop, the crop next to the block or the crop to be sprayed. Uh, if you are a farmer who is uh, growing French beans, and then you are planting French beans as a program. So you have one block uh, that is harvesting and the next block, which is young, and you are spraying the young crop uh, using a, a, a pesticide with a longer PHI, which is next to a block that you are harvesting. So you want to ensure that uh, there is a barrier that is separating those two crops to ensure that the one that is being harvested does not uh, get uh, drift contamination. Then consider the people working in the spray field uh, because of the health. You cannot spray when the next field is being worked on. So you ensure that um, the people working are far away from the area that is being sprayed. So when you come to actual spraying, after the decision has been made that uh, now we are spraying, Sure that you observe one is calibration. What is calibration? Um, the chemicals are put or are mixed 
uh, with filler materials or inactive materials in a liter. Let's say, for example, a chemical could have uh, two percent of the active ingredient in a liter. So it's that active ingredient that is becomes that becomes effective or kills the best one it is spread on a, in in a crop. So you need to know the mechanism of spreading the two percent of the active ingredient or the chemical or the product into um, one acre, for example. So you need to do calibration. And what is calibration? Calibration is uh, you get to know you have to get to know the flow rate of uh, the item that you are using as your spray equipment. Let's say, for example, you are using a knapsack. The knapsack has the tank, has the lens, and the nozzle. The nozzle is the part that uh, changes or atomizes the droplets because you have the liquid in the, in the tank and it has to be turned into a spray, a spray um, uh, into a mist for it to be to become effective. So once you're pumping, you are actually putting on pressure as the liquid goes and passes through the nozzle uh, at, at high pressure, the nozzle atomizes those droplets and changes, changing them into very tiny droplets that so that they can fall onto the leaves and be able, can be able to cover the pest that is being sprayed against. So how do you calibrate? Uh, you simply look for um, a container. Then you ensure that you are using clean nozzles. Um, you spray inside, you prime your pump, and then you release the, the tree to allow the chemical to get into the container. You collect the chemical, or it could be not chemical. You don't do you don't do calibration with chemicals. You use plain water. So you put plain water in a in a knapsack like five liters. Then frame the pump very well, and then uh, direct the water into a container. You collect it. You have to have a stopwatch. A stopwatch. You run the stopwatch. You spray with in that container for one minute. And then you get a measuring cylinder and you put the, the liquid into the measuring cylinder and so that you, to get to know the amount of liquid that is sprayed by a knapsack using those particular nozzles within one minute. Possibly you could get that a, a nozzle is uh, giving or the flow rate is 0.7 um liters liters per minute so that's the flow rate then uh if your field has beds and uh you have like 50 meter beds you can ask your sprayer to walk just take a walk the way he sprays then using a stopwatch see the number of seconds that he's going to to use to walk over a distance of 50 meters. Practically, I've done it and uh, they use 30 seconds to walk in, um, in a distance of 15 meters. So if the nozzle is emitting 0.7 liters per minute and that person is using 30 seconds to walk, so you divide 0.7 divided by 60 seconds multiplied by 30. Then you get to know the, the amount of liquid that you will use in one line. Then you will multiply that liquid by the number of lines or the number of rows within that one acre. Let's say you have, for, you have uh, uh, 53 beds in an acre measuring 50 meters each. So it is uh, 0 0.7 divided by 60 times 30 seconds you get the liquid that is being applied in one in one bed, multiplied by the number of beds. That is the liquid that you use in one liter. So, and then you you know that's the, that that information will get will give you the number of knapsack that you use in that one liter, and the 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 amount of chemical to put into that one liter. 
is, is done properly through supervision, of course. So I've addressed the calibration and the coverage. Then the PHI, this pre harvest interval, uh, needs to be observed to ensure that um, if you are a growing crop for human consumption, it's very, very important. Even for animal consumption, it's very, very important. If there are PHI to be observed, you have to observe. Then number four is record keeping. Last week, we were talking about good agricultural practices and uh, enhancing good agricultural practices. You can even you can do it very wrong when it comes to crop protection. So record keeping is a must. This one is not, you have to keep records. Then you have to follow the label. I usually say that uh, farmers usually say extension officers are no longer there. Uh, we do not know how to use chemicals, but the label has all the information you need to know about pesticide application. As I say, this is a very wide topic. And uh, um, what I've shared with you is like a need of what is there to be shared. And uh, I may not know what you know unless you ask me questions. And uh, I hope within that time, I've been able to move you from where you are. And now you are competent. One, the objective of my talk is I try to bring you up to speed to where I am. Or even if you can go past me, that would be very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Uh uh, thank you very much for that uh, details presentation on crop protection. I think, uh, yeah, this is like uh, taking us through the whole syllabus of, uh, uh, of crop protection, uh, but I still feel that there's more that uh, you could not present here, and that can come when people have uh, individual engagements with different agronomists uh, all over. So it is always better to uh, be very close or get in touch with the nearest uh, uh, agronomist, or if you don't have one, uh, soccer is here. And that is our core business uh, to advise you or to give you the best qualified person to help you in your farm. Um, uh, David, before you take any questions, I would like us to, uh, for purposes of time, to go to our next presenter, and uh, this is uh, Dennis. Uh, Dennis uh, will take us through some uh, uh, organic systems for crop protection, because I know we uh, we deal quite a lot with the chemical uh, crop protection products, but we also have some other uh, organic uh, ways of uh, controlling pests and disease. And I think uh, David is, uh, is Dennis is passionate about this. Let's hear from him, and then we will take all the questions together at the end of the show. Uh, so, Dennis, if you are ready, uh, could you uh, tell us what you have today? Dennis, are you in? Okay, as, as we wait for Dennis to, to, to come in, maybe I could come back to you, uh, uh, Peter. And uh, this is uh, this question is mainly to do with uh, um, the perception that we have in the market uh, about use of uh, chemical uh, controls. Um, from your presentation, I can see that you really uh, made it clear that once these things are used, these chemicals are used in the correct dosages, the correct timing then they are not harmful and dangerous. So as we wait for uh, uh, Dennis to come in, could you quickly go through that and just uh, assure our, our audience or the farmers that these chemicals, if used properly, are not dangerous? Thank you. Um, um, I would like to, to say that um, for chemicals, like any other dosage like a, a, a person is given, every chemical has some instructions on its label that guides you on how you're supposed to use the chemical. Say for example, you have some flu 
and you are given some suggestions. The doctor will always prescribe that you need to use, like say for example, 10 ml uh, per day, once per day. So when you are using this chemical, there is always um, an instruction that is given on the label. And often it's given uh, maybe per, uh, per ml, for example, 20 ml per 20 liters of water. So for example, when you use um, in excess, you may actually bring about issues of phytotoxicity to the crop. You actually damage the crop. Again, um, this also brings in the discussion on uh, PHIs. So whenever you use a chemical, there is a guidance that uh, tells you that you can't harvest this crop maybe until seven days are over. So for example, given the chemical tells you that you need to, use, you need to harvest after seven days, so how well are we following uh, these instructions? So will you go about harvesting before seven days? Are you going to harvest on the seventh day? Yeah. So you as a farmer need to understand what this issue of PHI means and what MRLs mean. So for example, if you harvest uh, before uh, the days given, it means that you have exceeded the maximum residue levels of that chemical in the in the product, and it, then it becomes unsafe for use. So it also um, matters a lot on our discipline on how we are using these chemicals. Follow best the practices that are actually guiding the use of that chemical. Otherwise, if it is used uh, incorrectly, it becomes um, uh, hazardous to both the, uh, the crop the environment, the user, and actually um, the consumer at the end of the day. So it, it's all about uh, the discipline on following instructions that are provided. But, yeah. Yeah. OK, thank you, Peter, for that explanation. And uh, back to, to David. But uh, if, uh, if Dennis is, uh, is now available, uh, please interrupt, and uh, <clears throat> we will give you the time to go. Hello. <coughs> Hello. Yes, uh, hello. hello. Uh, are you getting me? Yes. Is that Dennis? Yeah, this is Dennis. Yeah, please go ahead. We, we are ready to hear from you. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I'll just share my screen. Uh, Dennis, could you have your microphone in the right place? Yeah, so uh, uh, just a little bit in the Okay. Having so I'll basically go through panic farming and I have Joshua, uh, Dennis has dropped off. I think we need to proceed to back to Q and A. I think his connection is having problems. Sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for that uh, uh, connection issue that uh, Dennis is having. But uh, we will have him back as soon as he's uh, is ready, uh, because he has a very important topic to discuss with us, and that is on organic systems uh, for crop protection, uh, which of course. Uh, is a thorny issue to many of us. Uh, there are those who, who still believe that, uh, you know, uh, pests and disease can only be controlled through chemical usage. But uh, the organic people also uh, have their say, and uh, they have some very interesting stuff that could help in the in the general uh, uh, crop husbandry and uh, protection of crops. 
um, in the meantime, as we wait for him to be back, I uh, would we'll go back to, to David. And uh, David, uh, I have a question for you because there has been a lot of concern from uh, lobby groups uh, touching on work, uh, worker safety. And I think you briefly touched on that in your presentation. Um, is, is there any fear uh, for, you know, uh, or health hazards that uh, our citizens are facing, especially those who are working in the agricultural sector? And uh, of course, there has been a lot of litigation worldwide, uh, the famous one being a recent one touching on Roundup. Um, uh, what do you have to say about uh, <clears throat> this topic that keeps on popping up, that people don't seem to be accepting that we, you, you can actually spray the crops safely as long as you are well protected? Yeah, thank you, Joshua. Uh, yeah, it's true. And uh, the fears are genuine because chemicals are hazardous to health. And uh, that's why measures have to be taken when uh, or before spring is done. And uh, there are quite a number of assessments. There's something called cost control substances, substances as hazardous to health. Uh, the reason as to why this one is put in place, um, uh, cost analysis, is because chemicals are harmful, uh, hazardous to health. So you need to ensure to know that uh, when you're spraying, Chemicals, although they are mixed with water, they are not actually water. They are things that can uh, are dangerous to your health. So the PPE, uh, that's why PPE comes into play. And uh, the first person who can, who started the highest risk of harm from chemicals is the spray, is the store operator. Because this is the guy who handles chemicals in their concentrated form. The next person on the line is the spray operator. See so the store operator, then the spray operator. The spray operator uh, handles chemicals in the semi-diluted uh, form or semi-concentrated form, uh, which can uh, quickly lead into a, a hazard into life if they are consumed or they get into contact with the, uh, the skin or they are inhaled. Uh, the third person are the people working in the field. So good agricultural practices uh, dictates that for a field to be sprayed, the workers must be cleared or must be told to move away from that field. And even after spraying, then keep away for a number of hours, uh, based, depending on the labor recommendation. And this is what is commonly known as the entry period. Um, for those who do not want, who do who spray without taking precautions or using PPE, uh, that is ignorance and uh, it is regulatable. But the most important thing is that those who don't uh, use PPE should ensure that they use PPE to, because this is health. You not be, you may not feel pain uh, from the chemical exposure, but it can affect you in long term. This is like vile mucho ina kula kikingi. Uki kama umeyo na kikingi mekulua na mchwa, umeyeka kikingi chini ya mchanga, mucho ina aza tu kuuma kido wa kido. Itakui me ile kikingi itakua chini na itakui mekuliwa na imeisha. So, Yo chemical, somebody, you start with um, smelling it. If you can smell it, it's affecting you. And this is how you should use your chemicals. Please keep away from, if you are smelling it, use a mask or keep away, keep off from the area that is being sprayed. Mm. Yeah, sure. Thank you, thank you, uh, David. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to take a few questions before we, we proceed to the next level. And uh, I have a few questions for uh, the two of you, to the two gentlemen uh, with us today. And uh, one of uh, the questions is, uh, what is your view on a emotive campaign against chemical crop protection? I think you've just answered that question. 
And uh, the next one is, uh, please comment on homemade pesticides, e.g. from crushed leaves, and what is the extent of application by farmers? There is also a question on how do you control moles? Moles, this is Foucault, yeah? I think so. And uh, another question is, uh, please comment on the different stages of pests and more so that are beneficial and how they can be maintained, e.g. butterflies, which are pollinators and yet the caterpillars are harmful. So um, I would split these questions to both of you. So David, you can take the first, uh, the first two and uh, Peter will take the next, uh, the, the remaining two. If you need uh, me to repeat the question, I will do, but uh, if you can go straight, then please do. Good, uh, thank you, Joshua. Uh, this is a very interesting question about the crashed leaves. So um, viewers, it's very important to know that um, the chemicals that we use have things called active ingredients, which are measured and specified in the container that uh, each chemical that is contained, that contains chemicals. So once you crush the leaf, they may be effective, but uh, chances of getting to know uh, what you are applying or how, what quantity of the, of the active ingredient, because whether you are using those crushed leaves, there is that active ingredient that's, that's providing the kill. It's really hard to quantify that active ingredient. And then when we talk about chemical residues, uh, these chemical residues can be measured if you know what is contained in a container. The fact that you have crushed the leaves doesn't mean that that, that leaf is safe. Uh, and this is where I pick some issues with our organic friends who advocate for plant leaves or plant extract that have no known ingredients or have no ingredients that are measurable in any quantity. So they could work, but to get to know the quantity that is working uh, and what you're applying to the chemical and to the plant and whether uh, it is safe or not, that is a subject that can be discussed. But what I would say is that, uh, yeah, it can be used, but not professionally. On the molds issue, uh, that one is a tight one because uh, you can use mechanical or manual trapping for moles. There are guys who are, are good in trapping moles and one can always look for their service. Um, that one will be answered by my friend Peter. Okay, Peter, go ahead. Thank you so much. I actually like the question about moles and uh, David mentioning mechanical metal. I think we've grown up, uh, we grew up knowing that uh, Foucault's uh, can only be mechanically removed from the soils. So you you actually dig in and get to the point where you actually reach to the moles. But um, again, we also have uh, chemical control methods whereby you, you actually identify the, the breathers, uh, the breathing points of uh, the moles, and identify the crop, uh, the target crop in that field. For example, if it's a maize uh, field, you can actually take the chemical, um, apply, it, apply it on the, on the, on the leaves uh, for the crop, that, the target crop, and then put it in that breather. So often when it comes up, uh, out to feed, it will actually uh, consume um, that chemical and you actually eradicate the, the moles. So the questions, uh, the question on um, uh, butterflies and uh, the caterpillar stage. So I would like to look at it um, in the uh, manner of its economic advantage. So if its economic dis uh, disadvantage outweighs the economic advantage, it is best that we control it even at the, uh, at the, uh, the caterpillar stage. Because um, again, we know the main pollinator um, in crops is, uh, is bees. So if you would let the, the cut, uh, I mean the larval stage to, to grow to a butterfly for, for the impact of uh, pollination, that, then it means that you actually not reap the maximum benefit of, on, of that crop.
So it's best that we control uh, the larval stage of that caterpillar and let other pollinators do the job so that we actually maximize on profits, especially on the uh, target crop. Yeah. I would defer the question on scouting sessions to, to David. David, go ahead. Can you come in on what was the question? Um, what is the side effect of exceeding the chemical dosage? Ah, oh, okay. Um, good. And and also, uh, David. Also, you could also explain more on the on the scouting because I think there's uh, uh, we need to understand a little bit more on the on, the, on scouting and, and particularly the uh, use of having scouting stations uh, in in the farm. So exceeding the dosage rate is. Um, is very dangerous, is against the rules. Uh, chemicals, as I said before, uh, we get the instructions on uh, how to spray the chemicals through what manufacturer has recommended. So if you ask to use uh, 20 mils in a knapsack, that is what you're supposed to do. Because um, when the PHI are fixed or are set, there is data collection in terms of analyzing the amount of uh, residue that remains in that land or produce, for example, a kilo, a certain quantity of French beans. If a product is three days PHI, that one has been analyzed based on the recommended dosage rates. If you exceed, it means that you may keep or maintain the PHI, but if the produce was to be analyzed, it could exceed the maximum residue level. And that's the danger of exceeding the dosage rate. The best thing is to ensure that you stick to the dosage rate because if you use less, there's a likelihood of encouraging resistance. So either way, it's bad. Number two, on scouting, um, scouting you said, the best, uh, how do you do the scouting? And the reason, the reason why as to one has to do scouting is well understood. You go into the field, let's say for example, one acre, and then the best practice you do, you set 10 stations. These stations are set in order to enable you to get to know, instead of looking at the whole field, you may go into a bed and you don't know whether you have walked into the same bed. So the best thing is to choose uh, 10 spots randomly, and those becomes the representative of the block. So when you go to the station one, you get to see a normal, a, a good healthy plant looks healthy, and anything that does not look like a plant, or does not look, if you, let's say, for example, you have cabbage, cabbages in the field, an acre of cabbages, we go into that field, anything that doesn't look like a cabbage is a nuisance to that cabbage. It could be a weed. Anything that is, uh, any plant that is abnormal, it could be either having uh, affected by pathogens or disease pathogens, or maybe having a physiological disorder that is anything related to weather effect, could be frost or uh, deficiency. So once you go into a station, you are looking at any abnormality in terms of disease or physiological disorder or a pest that could be in the plant. Then for every plant, you have to know the most important uh, or the significant pest for that particular crop. For example, uh, thrips in cabbages, are not as dangerous as thrips in onions. So if 
when you're looking for cabbages, 5% of thrips in cabbages may not prompt you to spray, but 5% of thrips in a crop of onion will call for a spray. Um, I hope I have explained. Yeah, good. Thank you very much, uh, David. <laughs> I think that's a, a good explanation. And uh, we'll probably take one more last question. And uh, this is from one of the, uh, the viewers who asks, uh, between bacteria, viruses, and fungi, uh, which microbes are dangerous and causing a lot of challenges to farmers in the field? From your own experience, uh, uh, David, which of these uh, could be the biggest challenge to uh, food sustainability? Uh, all of them are uh, uh, dangerous to the crops because it also depends on the crop. For example, uh, if you have bacteria, uh, causing bacteria wilt in potatoes or tomatoes, they are very dangerous. And I would want to say that any, any fungi or bacteria that is soil born becomes a major, a big problem because it's, it's very hard to eradicate it once the plant has already been planted. Once the plant, once you see the symptoms, you you have potatoes in the field. If you see bacterial wilt, there is nothing that you can do apart from maybe rooting it. Uh, using pesticides, sometimes farmers use pesticides when the crop is already there, which is uh, self-defeating. For example. I want to explain, and um, I know I'm going to get into problems with the cell chemicals. So you have bacterial wilt in the in the in the that are affecting your potatoes. Then the guy comes. That that bacterial wilt is already in the soil. So and you have seen the symptoms in in the plant. So that means the bacteria have moved from the soil and affected have affected your potatoes, and that's why the potato is wilting. If you come and apply the, the chemical in the soil, you will not be targeting. And this, the soil is a big mass. Possibly the chemical will only go to 10 centimeters. But the other, the other, below that, there'll be pathogens that will keep on attacking your crop. So um, the best way or the best uh, preventative mechanism or the best measure is to uproot, whatever you can uproot. If it attacks about 40%, 60% of the entire field, then you do away with the whole crop, and then you either do crop rotation, or you can clean the soil. If for those guys who are doing uh, greenhouses, you can do something like sodium, methyl, uh, you know, methyl sodium. Methyl sodium has a, a, a methyl isothiocyanate chemical in it which kills bacteria, fungi in the soil. It's the same uh, active ingredient that being used that was present in um, methyl bromide, although methyl bromide was discontinued, but um, sodium is still acceptable and you, can, and you can use it. So to go back to, to the question, both fungi and bacteria are all dangerous. If you get, uh, if, you are, if you are a pea farmer, sugar snap or snow peas farmer and your soil is uh, infected by fusarium um, the fusarium can wipe the whole crop so they are dangerous okay thank you david uh, i think we've uh, exhausted uh, most of our questions for tonight uh, oh sure there's one uh, what uh, could you explain the use of bt in crop protection bacillus yes. Bacillus origensis. Mainly, yes. BT is used for control of caterpillars. And um, the way the bacteria acts, it's once it's ingested by the caterpillar, it affects the gut of the caterpillar, and then it discontinues eating. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Peter. Uh, for your indulgence and accepting to be with us three weeks consecutively, David. Uh, and, and thank you, Peter, for joining us today. I think we will hear a little bit more from you in the oncoming uh, uh, sessions. Um, I would say we have today looked at uh, the approaches to pro uh, crop protection, 
we have analyzed uh, different strategies of control, uh, which all is integrated into integrated uh, pest control. Uh, uh, so with that, we would like to close our session today. And uh, just to thank you all again for yeah, attending to this session. Uh, next week, we will have a little bit more uh, uh, different ideas about uh, crop protection methods, and that will be touching on mainly on organics, organic uh, uh, controls. So I think that will be also a very interesting topic for most of the farmers. And uh, we would like to compare eh, and give farmers uh, a choice uh, and also to ensure to assure them that what is currently being carried on uh, as far as uh, chemical usage in our farms is concerned is completely safe and uh, on that note uh, once again thank you panelists and thank you audience for being with us tonight until next week it's bye-bye from us thank you thank you joshua